we're going to continue the discussion of geometric algebra of two dimensions. And what we're going to do in this video is talk about how to project vectors, reject vectors, and reflect vectors. Now the outline is as follows. First we're going to review the abstract objects that we've constructed up to this point, which is GR2, the geometric algebra of R2. Then we're going to review the geometric product, talk a little bit more about the dot product and wedge product. Then we're going to derive some formulas involving the projection of vectors, the rejection of vectors, and also the reflection of vectors. Let's keep track of the mathematical objects we've introduced up to this point of the geometric algebra of R2. We started with the vectors, and we had two vectors. We had E1, which is that vector pointing in the horizontal direction. Some people call this one I, but I call it E1, and other people call it E12. And secondly, we had E2, which was a vertically directed vector. Some people call this J, I call it E2. So we had two vectors here. Then we started talking about the dot product between the two, and that led us to the discussion of scalars. And we had one sort of scalar uh, represented by the number one. So we had the geometric interpretation of these vectors as directed line segments. And I forgot to point out in the previous video, you can uh, geometrically interpret the scalars as just points. They don't really have any direction, just a magnitude. So we introduced the scalars via the dot product. And then we talked about the wedge product, which introduced these new sorts of objects called the bivectors. And we had really only, only one sort of bivector, which was E1 wedge E2. But we saw we can just write it as E1 E2. And recall what this was. This was the parallelogram formed by considering E1 and E2 as the sides, completing that parallelogram here and attaching an orientation to it. Now since these vectors are obtained by taking one vector at a time, by considering one vector at a time, these are sometimes called the grade 1 objects within GR2. And correspondingly, the bivectors, since they're obtained by considering two vectors at a time, these are called the grade 2 objects. And by extension, the scalars, since they're obtained by considering no vectors at a time, these are called grade 0 objects. And I think I talked about this a little bit in the previous video, but this is some of the terminology here. So within this abstract vector space, GR2, you have different grades. We have three different grades, the grade 0, the 1, and the 2. And also notice that in this abstract vector space, we have four dimensions. We have four basis vectors. We have one scalar, two vectors, and one bivector. Besides reviewing the abstract objects that we've developed, let's review the geometric product, which remember if I had two vectors, U and V, the geometric product UV was defined to be the sum of the dot product between the two and the wedge product between the two. And after playing around with this a little bit, we found that those basis vectors E1 and E2 have the following important property that E1 times E1 or E1 squared is equal to 1. And the same thing is true for E2. E2 squared is also equal to 1. And we also found that the bivector E1 times E2 Instead of squaring to plus 1, that actually squared to minus 1. So these were some of the, the key features of the geometric product we discovered last time. Another important property that is going to allow us to talk about the, ve the vector inverse was that if we stick the same vector into the geometric product, if we have something like u times u, or just u squared, let's check out what happens here. We have u dot u, but then we had u wedge u. And remember, the wedge product of a vector with itself is going to go to 0. And also remember that u dot u is equal to the squared magnitude of a vector. So we also found that the square of a vector under the geometric product is equal to the magnitude of that vector squared. Now check out what happens if I divide both sides by the squared magnitude of u. So I'm going to have u squared over the squared magnitude of u is equal to 1. So just doing a little rearranging here. Now this is quite important and to show why it's important let me write u squared a little bit differently. I'm going to write it as u over the square magnitude of u times u is equal to 1. So this is saying that if I take some vector, let's say u, and I just so happen to multiply by u over the magnitude of u squared, that gets me back to 1. So what that actually implies is that this vector I'm looking at here, this first thing, is the inverse of u. So that means that u inverse is equal to u 
over the magnitude of u squared. So what this is saying is that any vector that is not the zero vector has an inverse vector, a vector such that when it's multiplied by the other vector under the geometric product, that gets you back to one. And that special vector happens to be that same vector divided by the squared magnitude. Now geometrically, this is nothing really uh, esoteric. If I have some vector that looks like this, for example, let's say that's my vector u, let's suppose that the magnitude of u is greater than one. So if the magnitude is greater than one, this denominator is going to be greater than one, which means that u inverse is going to be shorter than u. So u inverse might look something like that, a little bit shorter. Instead of the magnitude being greater than one, let's suppose it's less than one. So if that's less than one, the denominator is going to be less than one, which means I have u divided by something less than one that's going to increase the size of u. So if this is u, u inverse might be a little bit longer if, you, if the magnitude of u is below 1. And as you may suspect, what if the magnitude of u is equal to 1? We can hopefully you can see here that that implies that u and u inverse are the same. So hopefully you can see that that inverse vector is going to be in the same direction as the original vector, but that's a nice little concept that we get out of geometric algebra that you can talk about in addition to multiplying vectors, you can talk about dividing by vectors because we can talk about the vector inverse. Now, having said that, let's return back to the geometric product. And let me remind you of a few other things we discovered in the last video. If I had some vector u and another vector v, if these two vectors u and v just so happen to be parallel to one another, so u is parallel to v, that implies that the geometric product uv is equal to VU, that the geometric product commutes when the two vectors are parallel. And the short explanation behind that is that the wedge product goes to zero, and a dot product just commutes. So hopefully that's review. And another special case, let's say U is perpendicular to V. So let's say that's U. Let's say that's V. They're perpendicular. What that implied was that the geometric product is anti-commutative. So when you flip the order, you got to stick a minus sign in there. And the short explanation behind that is that in this case, the dot product actually goes to zero. And the wedge product, when you flip the order here, that comes with a minus sign. So these are two special cases to remember. When we have two vectors that are parallel, the geometric product commutes. When the two vectors are perpendicular, the geometric product anti-commutes. You gotta stick a minus sign in there. One final preliminary about the geometric product I'd like to point out before we talk about projections and reflections is that instead of writing the geometric product in terms of the dot product and wedge product, we can actually do the converse, which is write the dot product and the wedge product in terms of the geometric product. And to show you that, let me, instead of considering uv, let's consider vu. So that's going to be equal to v dot u plus v wedge u. Now remember the dot product is commutative, which means I can flip the order here without a sign change. So that's equal to u dot v, but this wedge product is anti-symmetric, which means if I flip the order, I've got to stick a minus sign. So v wedge u is equal to minus u wedge v, and that line is still equal to v u. So look at what happened there. When I switched the order of the vectors in the geometric product, the part dealing with the wedge product flipped sign. So I'm going to take advantage of that, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this equation here, and I'm going to add it to this equation. So on the left hand side I have uv plus vu is equal to, now look at what happens on the right hand side, this wedge product u wedge v cancels with minus u wedge v, and I have u dot v plus another copy of u dot v, so on the right hand side I'm left with two times u dot v, and just solving for u dot v, I get that that's equal to one half uv plus vu. So what I've done here is I've written the dot product in terms of the, ge of the geometric product. Now I can play the same game with the wedge product. What I'm going to do is I'm going to take this line and subtract away this line. So what I have is uv minus vu is equal to. Now what happens here when we subtract u dot v minus u dot v goes to zero. And over here I have u wedge v minus minus u wedge v. So that means on the right-hand side, I have two copies of u wedge v. 
answers dividing by 2 on both sides, I get that u wedge v is equal to 1 half uv minus vu. So now I've written the wedge product in terms of the geometric product. So these two formulas are kind of nice to keep in mind, just showing the relation between the dot product, wedge product, and the geometric product. And we're going to see these pop up uh, shortly when we talk about projections. I think our toolkit is sufficiently large to start talking about vector projection. And let me set up the problem. So I've got some vector u, and I've got another vector, which I'll call v. And what I'm looking to do is project the vector u onto the vector v. And the way that's typically explained is you imagine shining some light upon, uh, upon the vector u, and you look at the shadow cast upon the vector v. So I'm going to get that vector there, which I'm going to call u parallel, for the reason that u parallel is parallel to v. And this is going to be the projected vector. And in addition to this projected vector, I actually get another vector called the rejection, which is the vector formed by going from here back up to the vector u, which I'm going to call u perp, because u perp is perpendicular to v. So what I've done so far, just writing this out symbolically, is I've decomposed u into the sum, the vector sum, of u parallel plus u perp. What I'm looking to do is come up with a formula for u parallel in terms of the two input vectors u and v. And to do that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at this equation, and I'm going to multiply both sides of the equation on the right by v. So on the left-hand side, I have u times v is equal to u parallel times v plus u perp times v. And now we're going to have a bit of fun. We're going to exploit our knowledge of the geometric product to switch the order a few times. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at u perp times v. Since u perp is perpendicular to v, I'm allowed to switch the order to write v u perp, but with a sign flip. So the new right-hand side is going to be u parallel times v minus v u perp, and that's still equal to u times v. For my next trick, what I'm going to do is I'm going to return to this equation, and I'm going to solve for u perp. And the reason I'm doing this is I want to get the entire right-hand side in terms of just u's and u parallels. So I, I recognize that u perp is equal to u minus u parallel. So I'm going to stick that u minus u parallel right into u perp. So what I have is u parallel v minus v times u minus u parallel. That's still equal to uv. Now I just distribute the stuff there. I have that first term. Next I have minus v u. And finally I have plus v times u parallel. And that's still equal to uv. I'm going to take advantage of the properties of the geometric product one more time. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to look at v times u parallel. Now v and u parallel are parallel, which means I can commute them under, under the geometric product. So I'm going to move this equation up here. On the left hand side, I still have uv equals u parallel v minus v u. And I'm going to flip the order there. So I get plus u parallel v. Now notice what happens. I have two copies of that on the right hand side. And another thing I'm going to do is I'm going to move this minus v u onto the left hand side. So the next line is going to be u v plus v u is equal to two times u parallel v. And I'm going to divide both sides by two. So on the left hand side I have one half of u v plus v u is equal to u parallel times v. Now hopefully that left hand side looks a little familiar. That was the formula for the dot product of u and v. So this left hand side is actually just a scalar u dot v. And the right hand side is still u parallel times v. Now remember, the thing I was looking for is u parallel, so I want to solve for that. And with that concept of the vector inverse, I can actually do that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides on the right by v inverse. So on the left I have u dot v times v inverse is equal to u parallel v times v inverse. And since these two are inverses, the product is just 1. So I'm left with the formula. u parallel is equal to u dot v 
times the inverse. So that's the geometric algebra version of the projection formula for vectors. Now, this may look a little foreign. This may be the first time you've seen this, but it's actually not quite foreign. It's just a, it's probably something you've already seen. And to see why it is something you've already seen, let's recall what V inverse is. Now, V inverse was just V scaled down by the squared magnitude of V. Also recall that another way to write the squared magnitude of vector is the dot product with itself. V dot V is equal to the squared magnitude of V. So with that in mind, let me rewrite this as U dot V. Now V inverse, I'm going to have a V, the vector V. I'm going to have another scalar, V dot V. So this is probably the more familiar form of the projection form that you've seen, that the projected vector is some scalar multiple of V, and that scalar multiple is U dot V over V dot V. So hopefully that looks a little familiar. Another important thing to point out about this projection formula is that if it just so happens to be the case that the magnitude of V is equal to one, we saw before that that implies that V inverse is the same as V. So I can just make that substitution and that implies that the projection of U onto V is just U dot V times V. So I've got a formula for the projected vector U parallel and I claim there's also a formula for U perpendicular in terms of u and v. And there are a couple of different ways to derive this. You could use a similar argument as before. You can try multiplying both sides by v, playing around with that, and I encourage you to do so. Uh, the quick way that I'm going to do is I'm going to go back to the fact that u is the sum of u parallel and u perp, and I'm going to recognize that u perp is therefore u minus u parallel, just solving for u perp here. So I've got a formula already for u parallel, so I'll just substitute that right in. So that's u minus u dot v times v inverse. And what I'm going to do here is I'm going to factor out a v inverse from both sides on the, on the right-hand side. So what I'm going to have is u v minus u dot v all times v inverse. And hopefully you can see that if I distribute that v inverse back to both of these terms, I get back to that expression there. And now let's look at this thing, uv minus u dot v. So remember the, the geometric product was the sum of the dot products and wedge product. And this is saying that I've got the geometric product take away the dot product. So what's left? Just the wedge product. So what that means is that u perp is equal to u wedge v times v inverse. So there are my two formulas for vector projection, which was u parallel u dot v times v inverse, and the rejected vector, which was also called u perp, which is equal to u wedge v times v inverse. And this formula is also pretty neat, because remember this, this u wedge v was a bivector, and remember the action of multiplying by a bivector. That was some sort of rotation, and namely it's, it's a rotation by 90 degrees. So, and also remember that v inverse is in the same direction as v, so geometrically, the picture you can start to de develop here is that if we go back to that vector v, that same vector v, v inverse might look something like that in the same direction as v. So that might be v inverse. And when it's being multiplied by a bi vector, this vector v inverse is going to get rotated 90 degrees to form the rejected vector u perp. And it's also going to get it's going to get scaled by whatever the magnitude of that area is going to be. So those are the formulas, but let's consider a, an example. Let's suppose the vector v is equal to 2 times e1. So geometrically, this is going to look something like this, since e1 was that horizontally directed vector. So this is going to be v. And let's suppose the vector u that I want to project onto v is going to be e1 plus e2. So that's going to look something like that. And since v is equal to 2 times e1, we can also calculate the inverse vector. So remember, the inverse vector is v over the squared magnitude of v. The magnitude of v is 2, so the square of 2 is 4, which means to get v inverse, I've got to divide this vector by 4. So I get 2 over 4 times e1, or 1 half e1. So that means the vector inverse is going to go from there to about there.
I won't bother drawing it in. So what I'm looking to do is project u onto v to find that vector, u parallel, and also the rejected vector, u perp. So let's apply the formulas. So I have u parallel is equal to the dot product u dot v times v inverse. So let's calculate the dot product between u and v. So I have 1 times 2 plus 1 times 0. So I mean the dot product is 2. So I have 2 times v inverse. v inverse is 1 half e1. The 2's cancel. And what I find is that the projection of u onto v, or u parallel, is just plain old e1. And hopefully the picture lines up with the, the calculation. So we've got the projected vector u. Let's calculate the rejected version, u perp. So I could just uh, take u and subtract away u parallel, but let's have some fun with this wedge product. So the formula here is u wedge v times v inverse. So I've got to take the wedge product of u with v. And this will also be a good review of the wedge product. So I've got e1 plus e2 wedged with 2 times e1. And that's going to be multiplied by v inverse, which was 1 half e1. So let's calculate that wedge product. So I'm going to have first e1 wedge to e1. But remember, a vector wedged with itself is going to go to 0. So that first thing actually goes to 0. And what I have is e2 wedged with 2e1. So that's going to be equal to 2 times e2 wedge e1. And this is still being multiplied by 1 half e1. And it turns out those 2s cancel. You can move the 2s around and the scalars around as you wish. And hopefully in the last video, you remember that e2 wedge e1 can also be written as plain old e2 e1, where this is now the geometric product. And this is still being multiplied by e1 on the right. And let's take a look. I have two e1s there, so this is equal to e2 e1 squared. What's e1 squared? That's just 1. So that means, at the end of the day, the rejected vector u perp is just plain old e2. We've talked about vector projection, rejection, and let's close out the video by talking about vector reflection. So again, let me set up the problem by drawing a picture. Let's say I have some vector of interest, which I'll call u. And what I'm looking to do is reflect u across another vector, which I'll call v. So I'm looking to take u and reflect it across v to form some new vector, which I'll eventually call u prime. So to, to understand this pictorially, what I'm going to do is I'm going to project u onto v to form that vector right there, which again, I'll call u parallel. So I get the projected vector, and again, I get the rejected vector, which I'll call u perp. And I claim that in terms of understanding these vectors, all that vector reflection amounts to doing is taking the negative of u perp, which is going to be, it's going to look something like this, negative u perp, and adding it back to the projection to form the reflected vector u prime. So what we're doing computationally is we have a u, the vector of interest, and we have the other vector that we want to reflect across. We decompose it into a projected u parallel and a rejected version. I'm going to flip the u perp over there, and I'm going to add it back to u parallel to form the reflected vector. So symbolically, what I'm doing is uh, u is still equal to u parallel plus u perp. And the reflected vector u prime is going to be equal to that same u parallel, the same projected vector, but now minus the rejected vector u perp. Now this formula, the formula for vector reflection, is actually quite a bit of fun to derive. And similar to what we, we did before with projection, and this time what I'm going to do is I'm going to multiply both sides on the left, this time by v. So I have v times u prime is equal to v u parallel minus v u perp. 
And now I exploit my knowledge of the geometric product. What I'm going to do is I'm going to flip the order of these two, v and u parallel. But these two vectors are parallel, so when I flip the order, I don't have to flip sign. So what I have thus far is v u prime is equal to u parallel times v. And I'm also going to flip the order here. And remember that v is perpendicular to u perp, so that means I've got to flip the sign there. So this is actually plus u perp times v. And now notice both of these terms are being multiplied on the right by v. So I can actually factor that out to have u parallel plus u perp all times v. That's still v u prime. And now what, what is this expression here? u parallel plus u perp. Well, that's just plain old u. So what I have on the right-hand side is now u times v. So that's a neat little simplification that we get out of doing this, this geometric algebra. And now what I'm looking to do is solve for u prime, which is the reflected vector. And to do that, I'm going to multiply on the left by v inverse. So I get v inverse v u prime is equal to v inverse u v. And these two will multiply to 1 because they're inverses. And I'm left with the formula u prime is equal to v inverse u v. So what that means is that if I have this input vector u, I have u there, the reflected vector u prime is obtained by mapping u to the vector v inverse u v. So you hit it on the left with a v inverse and on the right with a v to get the reflected vector. So there's my formula for vector reflection. And for those of you who have been watching some of my quaternion videos, you'll probably notice that the, the formulas that we were getting out of thinking about 3D rotation and reflection were actually quite similar to this. You start with some object, in that case it was a quaternion, and it gets multiplied on the left and also by the right by two different things. So these formulas are they're all quite similar and there's actually a very good reason for that. And that's an idea we'll explore a bit further as we talk about geometric algebra. So let me close out the video, let me finally close out the video by giving you an example of vector reflection. It's kind of a simple example, but you'll see how the computation works. So let's suppose my input vector is u. That's going to look something like that. And let me suppose that u is e1 plus e2. And let's suppose I reflect it across the vector v, which I'm going to be e1. So there's my u, there's my v. And you can see geometrically the u prime vector is going to be sent down there somewhere. And since v, I chose v to be of length 1, so that implies that this is equal to v inverse. So I've got all the stuff that I need to do the calculation. So u prime is equal to v inverse, which we saw is e1. And then u is e1 plus e2. And then u gets hit on the right by a v, which was e1. And this is just a matter of distributing all the stuff. So I get first e1 squared plus e1 e2 still being multiplied on the right by e1. What's e1 squared? That's equal to 1. I get 1 plus e1 e2 all times e1. And then I distribute on the right. So I get e1 plus e1 e2 e1. And remember too that you've got, you got to pay attention to that order. you got to write it e1 e2 e1. You can't start commuting. Now when I do start commuting, i got to keep track of the sign flips. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to commute e1, e2. And when I do so, I'm going to have to flip the sign to get e2, e1 times e1. So e1 times e1, that's e1 squared. So that goes to 1. So I'm left with u prime is equal to e1 minus e2. And hopefully that makes sense with the picture. The e1 component is left the same. That's still a 1. That was a 1 there. It's still a 1. But the second component gets flipped in sign. This is a negative 1, whereas the u had a positive 1. Just to get you thinking a little bit more about this vector reflection, uh, let me 
propose uh, the challenge problem that I also proposed in my Quaternions and Reflections video, which is what happens when you do one reflection followed by yet another reflection. So let's say I had some input vector u, and I first reflect it across v. So I'm going to form some vector that's going to end up over there. And according to the formula that we've derived, this vector is going to be v inverse uv. But let's suppose I've got some other vector here, which I'll call w. And then I take that vector, and now I reflect it across w. So just looking at the rejected part, that new vector is going to end up somewhere down there. So now according to this, to the formula, that's going to be w inverse v inverse u v w because I take this vector and I hit it on the left with a w inverse and on the right with a w. So what I'd like you to do is describe for me the overall transformation from this vector to this vector. In other words, the composition of two reflections is equal to some other very important transformation. And tell me what that is. So as always, uh, if you enjoy my content, feel free to subscribe, uh, leave comments on the video, like the video, blah, blah, blah. And I thank you for watching.